from Hollywood, the Hollywood Radio Theater. Starring Jane Wyman and Will Rogers, Jr. in the story of Will Rogers. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. Irving Cummings. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. If a vote were taken for the most popular American of all time outside of public office, I'm sure Will Rogers' name would head the list. His keen perception, gentle humor, and simplicity made him one of the most beloved men of our time. Tonight, playing his original role in the story of Will Rogers, we have the perfect choice, Will Rogers, Jr., and as his co-star in this humorous drama from the Warner Brothers studio, their glamorous Academy Award winner, Jane Wyman, in her original role of Mrs. Rogers. Now, the story of Will Rogers, starring Jane Wyman as Betty Rogers and Will Rogers, Jr., in the title role. You'll find memorials to Will Rogers throughout the land, everlasting symbols of a nation's love and respect. Yet he did none of the things for which men are usually honored. He wasn't a soldier, a statesman, or a scientist. He invented nothing. He explored no new worlds. Why then is this man one of the great folk heroes of America? Maybe the answer is just as plain and simple as the man himself. And who could tell about him better than the woman who married him? Will rode into my life just after the turn of the century. Oklahoma was still Indian territory, and Ulaga, one of the few cow towns that boasted a railroad. If it weren't for that railroad, I wouldn't have been there at all. My sister's husband, Dave, was a station master, and I'd come for a visit. I saw Will tie his horse outside the station, just another saddle-weary drifter, and then he wandered into the baggage room. Anybody here? Quit hiding, Dave. I ain't the railroad inspector. Yes? Oh, I beg your pardon, ma'am. I thought Dave was, uh... He ain't been fired, has he? Oh, no. Mr. Marshall's on the committee for the Congress from Washington. And they're having a reception at the Rogers' home. Now, if there's something I can do for you, I... Uh, mean you're the baggage man? Well, is anything wrong with that? <laughs> Not at all. It's kind of interesting. Only ain't exactly got the bill for it, ma'am. Uh, may I have your check, please? Thank you. Is it a trunk or a valise? Well, it's more like a carpet bag, ma'am. It's about so big, and it's, uh... Can't I help you, ma'am? Oh, no, no. No, this is it right here. <laughs> sure is, ma'am. Only where's the banjo? The, the banjo? The banjo was tied here to the bag, ma'am. Why, it, it couldn't be here. I'd seen it. Ma'am, Clint Green once had a baby carriage shipped in here. The infant was nine years old before they ever found it. <laughs> and if I remember correctly, it was lost in that corner right over there. Well, mistakes can happen any place if it is a mistake. Well, I... I don't see anything like a banjo. Oh, I'm not saying it's here or it ain't, but it's worthwhile looking for a mite more earnestly. Uh, what might that be, ma'am? Well, that's a bathtub, of course. As if you didn't... Uh... Oh, dear. Uh, here, let me help you. Well, if you could just raise it up a little higher, please. I can't imagine how a banjo got under the bathtub. It ain't no harm done except the case. Bathtub seems to be in good shape, too. Well, I'm sorry about the case, but the railroad's responsible, so if you'll just fill out this claim sheet... That's all right, ma'am. I won't be needing a case. Don't aim to be traveling far anymore. Uh, can you play the banjo? No. And if you'll excuse me, I have to go now. I didn't mean to keep you away from your work. Well, it really isn't work. I've been invited to the Rogers house for that party, and I'd... Oh, well, you go right ahead, ma'am. We can finish this conversation later. Oh, indeed? Oh, yes, ma'am. We sure will. I'm sorry 
I'm late, Sally. And after promising to help with the refreshments and everything. Oh, you're not late for anything, Betty. Papa and the congressman just this minute wound up their powwow. But can't I help? You just get in the parlor. Your sister and Dave are there, and they'll introduce you to my brother. He just got back, and I want you to meet him. Oh, thanks, Sally. I guess I'm a little curious myself. Oh, Willie, how'd you get here, son? You ought to know, Pa. You sent me the money to come home. Oh, that's right. I did, didn't I? Well, it's good to see you, son. Now, if you'll excuse me, I got some news for the folks here. Uh, Ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, as senator of the Cherokee Nation, it gives me great pleasure to tell you that we've just smoked a pipe of peace with these congressmen from Washington, and in the not-too-distant future, Oklahoma shall become the 46th state of the Union. Now, those of you who want the details, go on in the dining room. As for the rest of you, well, you come here to dance, so get to it, folks. We got a good reason to celebrate. Come on, Billy. And this is my sister, Will, Betty Blake. Betty, this is Will Rogers. Hello again, ma'am. Again? How do you do? Mr. Rogers... I think it was mean of you not to tell me who you were down at the station. Well, uh, say, a name don't change anybody, ma'am. I don't want you to be fooled by my name. I may be Clem Rogers' son, but the similarity stops right there. Now, uh, for instance, uh, you see how good Pa cuts a caper? Well... (laughs) You come dance with me, and I'll show you the difference. I may not be able to put one foot in front of the other, but I try awful hard. Uh, Will you? Well, thank you. I... I think I'd like to. Later on, when most of the folks had gone home, I found myself out on the front porch, and Will was next to me, showing me the family picture album. And this one here, that's Ma and Pa when they were married. Ma died when I was 10. She was part Cherokee, too, so I get it from both sides. And uh, who's this little boy? Oh, that's me. All of these are me. Each one was taken when I started a new school. You must have run out of schools early. No, ma'am. Those schools, they kept cropping up like mushrooms. (laughs) Became a case of Pa and me out stubborn in each other. This one here is Pa's last fling, Kemper Military Academy. I was there for two years, one in the guard house and one in the fourth grade. (laughs) Mr. Rogers, now that you're home again, well, what is it you want to do? Well, uh, that's what Pa and I have been debating about a long time. Maybe if we got together, we ought to make a man out of me. Why don't you try it? Come on, Betty. I promised Mrs. Petros we'd be home early. She's taking care of the baby for me. Say, tell me something, Cora. Uh, Isn't it going to be kind of hard on you? I mean, raising a wild kid and helping Dave with the station work at the same time? I sure will. That's why I'm trying to make Betty stay. There's no earthly reason why she should go back to Arkansas. (laughs) Mind if I help out along those lines? Why, not at all, do you, darn? Oh, Cora, for heaven's sake. Oh, shush. Now help me find Dave, honey, and let's get on home. That you out there, Will? Be right in, Pa. Good night, Miss Blake. Good night, Mr. Rogers. Sit down, Willie. Glad to have you back, son. And I hope your foolish days are over. Uh, But, Pa, ain't you kind of tired with all this to-doing? Certainly not. I found it very stimulating. Well, you've been gone for two years. I'm interested to learn what you've accomplished. Well, I worked a lot of ranches, Pa. Met a lot of fine people. Gotten some practice with my rope. I even had an offer to go with a big roundup. If that's your ambition, that aimless drift in life, there's no use my even talking to you. You sent me a hundred bucks, Pa. Don't seem like you're getting your money's worth out of this conversation. I ain't with a roundup. I'm here. But are you any different than when you left? Pa, you and me have been making this same mistake for 20 years. You wanted me to be Clem Rogers' boy, and I've just stampeded away from it. I might do better as just plain Will Rogers. Why not give it a try? 
Things are happening around here. Big things. We'll need young, new leaders. Pa, the folks around here are on to me. Why well, couldn't lead them to a water trough? I'm trying to be patient, Willie, but I'm blamed if I understand you. It's time you face some responsibility. I can't argue that, Pa. Well, I'm opening a bank in Claremont. Between that and our coming statehood, I'll have little time for this ranch. Well, I'm turning it over to you. I'll run it your own way. But remember, ranching's a business, and the minute anything goes Are wrong... Are you threatening me or hiring me? I'm hiring you, sir. Thank you, Pa. I'm obliged. So Will took over his father's ranch, and I more or less made up my mind to stay in Ulaga. But less than a month later, Will was down at the railroad station again. So I'd like two tickets, Betty, uh, to Fort Smith. Two? Me and Dusty here. Howdy, miss. Dusty. Two round trips will be 980. One way will do. Will. Yeah, it's me and Pa again. Anyways, from Fort Smith, me and Dusty are heading down Texas way. So you're just going to run away again, hmm? Well, if you had any gumption, you'd stay here and face up to things and take your rightful place in this community. Like doing what, Betty? Well, after all, Will, you're a... Clem Rogers' son. Yeah, everybody keeps reminding me. I kind of got it figured out that I ain't. I'm myself. It wouldn't take much gumption to stick around here. It would be the easiest thing in the world now that you've decided to stay. Then why but... don't you? I can't. Maybe there's no explaining it, but I just got to get out of here. Well, here are your tickets. Here's your change, and there's your train. Thanks. Be seeing you, Betty. <laughs> Be seeing you, I was to learn, was a favorite expression of Will's, and his favorite form of correspondence I soon discovered was an occasional postcard. They came from Texas and New Orleans, and as the months dragged by from all over the world, South America, Africa, Australia, Will and his friend Dusty were traveling with the Wild West show, and then at long last, he was back in the United States. Well, where is he now? He says here that, that he and Dusty have just landed in San Francisco. Another postcard. Oh, but look what he says, Cora. Heading for the fair in St. Louis. Getting closer to home anyways. The St. Louis fair. Well? But that's where Sally and Tom are going. Will's own sister on their honeymoon. Oh, I know. But you could go with them. <sighs> well, at least you could meet them there. And then you could... I know I could. And I'm going to. the original Santa Fe Jack in his Wild West show. The greatest assembly of prairie daredevils ever gathered under one tent. You'll see Honey Girl Kate. You'll see Chief Big Horse of the Untamed Apaches and the one and only Cherokee Kid, the foremost roping artist in the world, fresh from triumphs before the crown heads of Europe, Asia, and the Greater Antilles. He can lessen the tale of a book. Yes, Will Rogers was now the Cherokee kid. <laughs> I couldn't help laughing. Oh, but the people didn't laugh when they saw Will perform. They thought he was wonderful. And I did, too. <laughs> or maybe I was just so glad to see him again. Surprising me like this? Why, when I saw you and Sally and Tom sitting there in the stands, I like to went through the floor of that arena. At least I wanted to. Oh, Will, but Why? Well, in that costume and the name they pinned on me, I never felt so silly in my life. Oh, but you're good, Will. You're very good. Are you hungry, Betty? Or would you rather just walk? Whatever you'd like, Will. Well, uh, seeing you, I'm kind of weak. But let's walk for a little, huh? What about Sally and Tom? Oh, they deserted me. Good for them. Say, which of them did Pa finally use the shotgun on? <laughs> Both, I guess. Oh, he gave them such a beautiful wedding. How is Pa, anyway? He's fine. He used to come down to the station, Will, just to read your postcards. He said he'd rather know the worst than not keep track of you at all. You know, when I was in all them foreign countries eating their food, I used to think about these Oklahoma black-eyed peas all the time. <laughs> is that all you thought about? 
Listen, Betty, for almost two years I've been thinking about you every minute. You have? Darn right I have. But I... I thought about you, too. Uh, Betty? Yes, Will? What would happen if I was to quit gallivanting around and come back to Oolaga to settle down? What would you like to have happen? Well, I haven't any money. Well, that isn't uh, important. I love you, Betty. Ever since I first saw you, I ain't... Um, I haven't had... I always say ain't, Will. I ain't been able to think straight about nothing except that I love you. Is that important? Oh, it's awfully important. Then you'll marry me? Yes, Will. Golly Moses, I feel like hollering. Well, why don't you? Yahoo! Yahoo! <laughs> We were married not long after, and another dream came true. We were on a train bound for a honeymoon in Niagara Falls. You know, Will, I don't feel the least bit married. Well, it's all right, honey. It's legal, even if it ain't logical. <laughs> you still haven't told me, Will. Um, told you what? Well, where's it all coming from? The money for this honeymoon at Niagara Falls. It must be very expensive. Well, uh... Now, honey, this ain't no time for a business conference. Uh, if you'll excuse me, I think I'll go for a smoke. Why, well, I didn't know you smoked. Well, uh, once in every man's life, there comes a time when he goes for a smoke. <laughs> well, uh, did you break it to her, Will? Uh, not yet, Dusty. I ain't found just the right moment, so you better stay out of sight. Got the horse on all right? Yeah, he's in the baggage car. Awful nervous, though. One of us ought to sleep up there with him. And if you ask me, you're the lot. Mm. Oh, all right, but it's your horse. <laughs> Sorry I took so long, honey. Somebody must have sewed up the sleeves of this nightshirt. Somebody like Dusty? Now, how in the world could Dusty be on this here train? Oh, I just saw him in the corridor. You... You saw him? Well, for heaven's sakes, what is it? Well, he's coming with us, honey, to look after the horse. The horse? What horse? Well, uh, the horse I'm going to use in the act. You see, that's how I aim to make the money we've been talking about. I, I'm booked with a big traveling show. It's, a, it's kind of a circus, I guess. Uh, we open in Buffalo. Well, that's right near Niagara Falls. But what about Oolaga? You said we were going home. We will, honey. At the end of the season, when we've saved up enough money to do it in style, we finish in New York, Madison Square Garden. But why didn't you tell me, Will? Well, I was kind of waiting for the right minute, like now. I'm telling you now. Of course, if you don't want me to... Oh, I should have told you, honey, but I just couldn't go creeping home to Pa broke again. But it's all right, Will. Everything's all right. But you mustn't ever be afraid to tell me anything. I'm your wife. And wherever you think you have to go, then I'll follow. Even if I'm following the train seals? <laughs> Even then. Thanks, honey. And often Will did follow the train seals. But no bride ever had a more wonderful honeymoon. I, I think the others enjoyed it, too. Will and Dusty and the horse. But we didn't go back to Oolaga after Madison Square Garden. No, fate had something waiting for us there. Something that changed the course of both of our lives considerably. We'll continue with this week's production of the Hollywood Radio Theater in just a moment. Make a friend, and you make an ally. There's a thought for you to keep in mind, as many another American has. G.J. Watamool, a naturalized United States citizen, has done much to bring the fruits of democracy to his native country, India. As one of Hawaii's most successful merchants, Watamool, with his American wife, established the Watamool Foundation over 15 years ago to bring Indian students to America. The first year... They offered 14 fellowships, paid for the students' passage to the United States and their tuition at a university of the candidate's choice, and gave them $150 a month for two years' living expenses. Since the foundation was begun, 
Industries all over America have offered their services to the Watamools in helping Indians learn modern techniques in pediatrics, the control of epidemics, food canning, and the building of machinery. Through the years, the Watamools have expanded their program to sponsor and exchange goodwill ambassadors between the United States and India. We should be especially proud of G.J. Watamool, who, as an American citizen, has proven to peoples of two nations that by helping others, you help your country. Now, our producer, Mr. Cummings. Act two of the story of Will Rogers, starring Will Rogers, Jr. in the title role, and Jane Wyman as Betty Rogers. Will had said that we'd finish in New York at Madison Square Garden, which we did. He also said that we'd go straight back to Ulaga, which we did not. On the final night of the show, something happened that wasn't scheduled on the printed program. A steer went wild. He broke out of the chute, charged across the ring, and lunged for the crowd. But in a matter of seconds, Will had galloped after him, roped, and dragged the animal back to the ring. Later, while we were walking back home to the boarding house... You know, I don't know just how to figure things. Here I've been roping night after night. I roped six horses all in a bunch, and nobody pays any attention to me. I rope one scared old steer, and everybody gets all excited. <laughs> everybody else just stood around watching. You were brave and resourceful and... Well, my goodness, those newspaper reporters didn't interview, interview you for doing nothing, you know. <laughs> well, honey, it was a good way to finish, I guess. Hard to believe it's all over, isn't it? Mm, I've loved every minute of it, darling. We've been together, and we've made enough money to buy us a nice piece of land back home. Yeah, but I'd like to have made enough to stock it, honey, you know, so we could be independent when we get back there. <laughs> well, all you have to do is collect the money you've been loaning to all your friends, and well, then... They'll pay it back, honey, just as soon as they can. You feel like eating before we get back to the Rome rooming house? Oh, we might as well go straight home, Will. I've got some chili up there. I never knew you were so crazy about chili before. Well, I get all sorts of funny cravings these days. Do you remember telling me there comes a time in every man's life when he has to go for a smoke? Now, don't tell me you're getting a craving for cigars. <laughs> Betty, now, now correct me if I'm wrong. Well, of course you're not, silly. You're going to be a father, that's all. That's all? Oh, my goodness. Now I am glad we're going back to Ulaga. Well, you mean you weren't before? Well, it was, sure I was. I just mean this puts the censure on it. Gosh, honey, you know, I feel like hollering again. Well, I don't think I'd advise that here in New York. Let's get the home quick where I can kiss you. Well, I don't think you have to wait that long, even in New York. <laughs> you know, I'm going right down and get us three tickets for Ulaga. <laughs> well, it'll be a long time yet before we're three. <laughs> I ain't taking no chances. The next morning, the newspapers were full of it. <laughs> no, not about the baby, but all about Will and how he'd stopped to panic when he roped that loco steer. And then, when the carriage pulled up at the boarding house to take us to the station... Yeah, well, good night, Mr. Goodbye, Mrs. Foster. Thank you. Goodbye, Betty. Been waiting for you, Mr. Rogers. I sure want to talk to you. Now, Will, not one cent. When it comes to complete strangers asking for... I'm Bert Lynn, Mr. Rogers, Lynn Theatrical Agency. We handle important attractions. I'm sorry, Mr. Lynn, but we have a train to catch, you know. But that stunt at the garden last night made him a big attraction. This is a legitimate offer. Ten straight weeks at $125 per. Well, that's a pretty fair offer, Mr. Lynn. Pennsylvania station driver. No, no, you can't. You open at Hammerstein's Victoria on Monday night. Mr. Lint, we're not interested in vaudeville. We're going home. Anybody can go home. This is Hammerstein's Victoria. I guess you didn't understand my wife. We, uh, we want to go back to the ranch. Will. You say something, honey? Well, I was just thinking, dear. Maybe if we postponed it for a while, you'll make that extra money you were talking about. Huh? Oh. <sighs> So uh, take the baggage out of the carriage, dear. And Mr. Lynn, will you pay the man? <laughs> Don't change them sheets, Mrs. Foster. We're coming back. <laughs> so Will played Hammerstein's Victoria. But this was a brand new audience, and they just weren't impressed. After Hammerstein's came those long, long months when we were just like all the other guests at Mrs. Foster's boarding house. Hopeful, but unemployed. And every day, Will called on Bert Lynn, the booking agent. 
I just can't understand it, Will. Six months going by and not a sign of a job. Guess I'm not good enough. That's the answer. Now stop talking like that. It's the theaters. They just don't want roping acts, that's all. I gotta get something, Bert. Betty's gonna have a baby any minute, and there'll be doctor bills, and... Bert, I'm desperate and I'm broke. I know, Will, I know. And just as soon as I... Hello? He... He's what? But he's supposed to be in Brooklyn. How could a guy get his foot caught in a bar rail? <laughs> Work a lanny again out on the south. Yeah, I guess you got your troubles too, Bert. Troubles? I booked him in Sam Webb's theater. That's only the toughest manager in the business. Now I gotta call him up and I've gotta. Uh, uh... Will, we'll get those ropes. You're going on in place of Berkelani. But, but Mr. Webb, he doesn't. I'll don't handle even... Mr. Webb just soon as we get to Brooklyn. Yeah, but what about Dusty and the horse? They're all part of the act. Phone him. Tell Dusty to rush over there. Here. Here's the address. Oh, I've been trying to book you there for months. But, but. Uh, yeah, yeah, sure. I... Tell me all about it on our way over. I can't do it, Bert. I just can't. I telephoned the boarding house. It's Betty. Well, they've sent for the doctor. But will you go on in three minutes? Besides, what could you do at the boarding house? Nothing, maybe. But I just can't let her be there alone. Look, I'll call him back. I'll stay right here on the telephone. I'll let you know the minute something happens. I can't do it, Bert. Besides, there's Dusty and the horse and no sign of him here then yet. Then just go out there and give him six minutes with your ropes. Think of your room rent. Think of your doctor bills. Go on. You can do it. Well, don't leave that phone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll pick up your ropes and get out. Poor Will. I was having a pretty bad time myself, but nothing I'm sure to what he was going through. For the first time, he was all alone on a stage. He'd never been so lost or so clumsy in his life. He couldn't blame the audience for laughing at him. <laughs> Mighty nice of you to laugh at me. Of course, it ain't no use to pretend I ain't nervous here tonight, because I sure am. Uh, you see, we're going to have a baby up at our place. Maybe you women don't realize what it means for a man to have a baby. <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> I don't know why I was so worried about coming out here to Brooklyn. Looks like it's a pretty nice place and full of very nice people. And, uh, now, of course, I'm supposed to have a horse out here, and I stand on him and do some tricks. Only the horse didn't show up. I don't know what he's doing, but I'll bet it's something useful. Uh, you know, horses are smarter than humans. You never heard of a horse going broke betting on people. <laughs> well, uh, lacking the horse, I'm going to try this here rope trick. Gee, I missed it. Got all the feet you What did I tell you, Mr. Webb? What did I tell you? That fellow's great, huh? I thought you told me he had a rope act. Why didn't you say he was a comic? Well, if I'd have told you, you wouldn't have believed me. Well, what do you say? The people like him. And I see where they got a new governor back in my home state of Oklahoma. He's a real fine governor, too, and the folks back there sure love him. Especially some of the folks who've been spending their time behind bars. You see, this governor's been sending out a lot of pardons and kind of getting the warden sort of worried. Anyway, he sent out so many that one old boy sent him back an answer. Why, shucks, Governor, he said, thanks for the pardon, but they ain't caught me yet. <laughs> Will, Will, it's a boy, and Betty's fine. It's a boy, folks, and Betty's fine. Yeah. <laughs> I got here, Mr. Lynn. Me and the horse, we just got here. He don't need the horse, Dusty. Will don't need nothing. He just talked himself into a brand new career. Yes, Will had a brand new career. He just went out on the stage and kept talking, never knowing what he was going to say until he said it, and always surprised at the success it brought him. In a few years, Will was a headliner, a star. And what people seemed to love most was to hear Will talking about politics and Congress. And then one day, the United States Secret Service ordered him to Washington. The request of President Wilson. I know I've said a lot of things about Washington, Mr. President. If I've offended you in any way, I'm sorry. I didn't ask you here to censor you, Mr. Rogers. For a long time, I wanted to thank you for your war work and everything else. That's mighty nice of you, Mr. President. And to be perfectly honest, I've always wanted to see the master of the verb ain't. 
I've heard you've had several offers to write. How is it I've never seen you in print? Why, uh, Mr. President, as an ex-college professor, you ought to know that I can't put two words together without making them come out wrong. <laughs> that may be, but from the quotes I've heard, your meanings come out pretty right. Mr. Rogers, uh, will, if I may. Now I feel like I can cross my legs. <laughs> <laughs> you, you say for people the things they'd like to say but can't quite express. And in helping them think things through, you're also making them laugh. That's a rare gift. That's why I think you should write as well as speak. Whether you like it or not, Will, you've become a voice from the heart of the people. Our country wants to hear it more often. of the United States had said all those things to me, I'd simply burst. I'm scared, Betty, honest. When they start taking me serious, well, that scares me. Well, it's just because it's something new. And besides, the paper prints what you say all the time and not just the funny things either, so you might as well let them pay you for doing it. It's no use, honey. Well, I couldn't sleep nights for worrying but what some poor soul might take me up on something and get himself into a peck of trouble. Oh, you're nervous, that's all. Just like you are on every opening night. But I'm not in the least bit nervous. But you just said you were scared. See how a fellow's words get twisted? Even you do it. But I don't notice that your words are being twisted at all. If you're so afraid of getting into trouble, then why do you say the things you do about people and governments and things? I didn't say I was afraid of getting into trouble. I said some poor fellow might take me serious and he'd get himself into trouble. It seems to me, Will, that you're just afraid to take the responsibility. Take my rightful place in the community? This is what you told me years ago. Is that still it? Oh, Will, I'm sorry. I didn't mean that. I understood when you left Ulaga, and I understand now. Only a wife likes to see her husband get the best that he deserves and give the best that she knows is in him. Look out now. You're beginning to spoil it again. <laughs> it's a closed subject, I promise. I know something else that's going to be closed, too. My big mouth. Will found a fine way to keep his mouth closed. He deserted Broadway for Hollywood's silver screen, which in those days was utterly silent. We bought a ranch in Santa Monica, and Will settled down to making movies. Well, one day, while they were shooting a scene out of doors, something happened that disturbed the producer considerably. Well, I'm not going to do it. Crazy fool. Landing his airplane right in range of our cameras. Harry, go tell that bonehead he just cost us a barrel of money. Who is that spendthrift, Tom? No, some half-wit aviator they hired to fly the film to the laboratory. One of your Oklahoma boys, hard Indian. You and that fool plane! You're costing us a young fortune! What's your name, son? Me? Wiley Post. Uh, hello, Mr. Bradley. Don't you hello me. <laughs> us Cherokees are a long way from home, aren't we? Oh, we sure are, mister. Say, uh, what's the matter with that kite of yours, anyway? Oh, you mean all that smoke it was making? Well, the engine needs a complete overhaul. Cost a lot of money, though. Seems to me, Tom, like the company might be saving itself some money if we got it fixed up for him. Well, maybe so. If we don't break the company first trying to get this scene shot. All right, Harry, let's try it again. Don't go away, Oklahoma. I want to have a talk with you. That was Will's first meeting with Wiley Post, the flyer. You see, Will was interested in aviation, too, especially in General Billy Mitchell and his theories that bombing planes could sink battleships. But just about that time, we had a visitor from Oklahoma, Will's father. Well, Willie, pretty fair ranch you got here. How many head of cattle you run? <laughs> Don't run none exactly, Pa. You see, here in California, they call everything a ranch, no matter what you use it for. This one's just for living. That's right, Pa, and for raising your grandchildren. I'm proud of you, Betty. You produce three mighty fine offspring. <laughs> well, they had a father, too, you know. That's the only thing about him that worries me. <laughs> <laughs> to tell you the truth, Pa, it worries me a little, too. Will, where's all this getting you? You've been making big money for years now. Saved any of it? Oh, some, Pa, I guess. Well, forgetting what you've given away, 
Just what are your assets? Huh? Assets? Uh, well, what are you worth? Well, I don't rightly know offhand. Pa, I think you got this whole thing figured out a little bit wrong. Why, after a few years of making pictures, I'm going to be able to... In your last picture, you were hit in the face with a custard pie. Hm. That's something to be remembered for. Anybody home? Oh, Wiley. Hello, Wiley. Sure glad you dropped in. You see the paper tonight? <laughs> Ain't had time for reading. Been having a business conference with Pa. Pa, this is Wiley Post from Chickasha. I'm glad to see you, How Mr. You Rogers. Go. Look, Will, the high brass has ordered General Mitchell to quit making speeches. Here's a man who's only trying to tell his own country that bows and arrows are out of date, and they won't even let him say it. He's already said it, Wiley. And when he sunk that old battleship with bombs from airplanes, he proved it, too. The country ain't going off to sleep with that on its mind. There'll be plenty of squawking. Who's going to do it? Fellows like you, fellows who know about planes, and anybody else that ain't asleep on their feet. They'd listen to you, Will. It's your beef, too. It's everybody's. No, I quit popping off that way a long time ago. No, I got too many responsibilities now to go looking for trouble. Besides, I got Betty and the kids to think about. I never heard such nonsense in my life. Uh, you'll have some coffee with us, won't you, Wiley? Oh, thanks, Betty, I can't. Some of the boys are having a meeting. Oh, so long, Will. Glad to meet you, Mr. Rogers. Uh, Goodbye. Be seeing you, Wiley. I'm sorry you couldn't convince him, Wiley. Thanks for the helping hand all the same. Um, Chuggish, huh? Mm, yeah. That boy's a great flyer, Pa. Lost his eye working in the Texas oil fields. Couldn't even get a flying license at first. Now everybody's looking for one-eyed pilots. Uh, what's nonsense about it? Everything. You're a good, kind man, darling, and you have a God-given talent. Now, if, if you haven't the courage to use it, that's up to you. But don't blame it on me and the children. Willie, you remind me of a fella... There's one in every little town. A fella who stands on the curb in front of the barber shop and makes fun of the parade going past. Yeah, I know. You want me to join it? Join it? Nothing. Your mother and I always figured you'd lead it. Well... Betty, I guess I got to get down off that curb. Yes, dear. I thought you would. In a few moments, we'll continue with Act Three of the story of Will Rogers. now for station identification. The curtain rises on Act Three of the story of Will Rogers, starring Jane Wyman as Betty Rogers and Will Rogers Jr. in the title role. And so Will started his campaign to help wake up America. In days when disarmament was the popular theme, Will spoke for defense and for aviation. Being a wife, I never reminded him that at last he was doing what President Wilson wanted, making people laugh and think at the same time. And somehow, he also found time to start writing his column for the newspapers. Then in 1927... Warner Brothers made a picture called The Jazz Singer, which revolutionized the film industry. The screen could talk, and talking pictures made Will its biggest star. But it wasn't long before Will was on his way again, this time overseas. He talked to prime ministers and shopkeepers up and down the continent. I'll have to stay in Europe a long time to find some country that don't blame America for everything that's happened to them in the last 15 years. Here in Germany, they got a fella named Hitler. He began in a beer hall, and he'll give the whole world a hangover before he's through. The whole thing as I see it all over the world is that the little nations has just got no business being little. Came home in the fall of 1929, just in time for the Wall Street crash. 
but I didn't give him a chance to catch his breath. I brought him back to Ulaga. I was being selfish, I know, but Will was tired, and I wanted to keep him with us as long as I could. Ulaga was the place he loved best. It was home. Look at them, Betty. Look at those kids ride. Well, they never look so good in their lives. You must have looked pretty good to them, too. I thought they'd tear you to pieces last night. Oh, yes, it's been wonderful for them here. I wish we could stay straight through the summer. Yeah, be like a second honeymoon. I owe you one without a horse on it anyways. <laughs> Say, uh, ain't that the Farleys out there going down the road? Mm-hmm. Yes, they're trying the cities, Will, to look for work until things pick up again. He's giving up the land? Well, lots of them are giving up the land. They've got to eat. Pa was saying that Orville Jones is leaving this afternoon. I, I guess men can't afford to go to a barber shop anymore. Betty, uh, let's ride to town, huh? Now? Now. There were others in town in front of the barber shop saying goodbye to Orville and his family. Well, Orville, you're getting smart, going out to California to be my neighbors. We ain't looking for no handouts, Will. I know you ain't, Orville. That don't mean we can't be neighborly when you get out there. I guess I'm a little touchy. So many things change around here. Seems a fellow sort of changes, too. Say, Will, what about this depression? What do you suppose caused it all? <laughs> Wish I could answer that. Of course, the Democrats are trying to pin it on the Republicans. But them Republicans ain't smart enough to think of all the thing that's been happening lately. <laughs> One thing, though, you sure can tell the two of them apart these days. The Republicans say... Well, things could have been worse. The Democrats say, how? <laughs> well, doesn't anybody give a hoot what's happened to us? Back east and out west, they're calling us Okies. Well, it, it just don't sit so good, Will. Spell back, I did a newspaper piece on George Washington. How proud he'd be of his country if he'd lived till his 200th birthday. Guess I didn't know what I was writing about. If old George was around today, I bet he'd sue us for calling him father. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe you don't make no sense, Will, but you sure make a fellow feel better. <laughs> Even if he is on his way to the poorhouse. Well, so long, Will, Betty. Goodbye, Orville, and good luck. <laughs> and when you get your barber chair set up out there, Orville, look me up. I haven't had a decent trim since the stock market crash. <laughs> well, I'll do that. Now, come on, boys. Give me a hand well, loading sure. up the Come on. Yeah, I'll I'll do 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 well, dear. It ain't right what's happening. It just ain't right. What can you do about it, Will? I don't know, but somebody's got to do something. I guess we'll just have to postpone that honeymoon, dear. Will left Ulaga, and some weeks later, the first of several huge benefit shows were produced at, at the Ziegfeld Theater in New York. Yes, Will was on the move once again, raising money and pleading with people not to sell their country short, then rushing back to the plane so Wiley Post could fly him to the next town. It went on for 151 days and nights, and one night in San Francisco, I surprised him. Betty, but how in the world did you find me? By trying every hotel in town. Will, why aren't you in bed? The rally wasn't over till long past midnight, and I got to meet Wiley at the airport at 4 o'clock. It just didn't seem worthwhile messing up the sheets. But you can't keep driving yourself like this. You're not a boy anymore. Why do you have to leave at 4 o'clock? Well, we're having a big breakfast get-together in Denver. All the big moguls going to be there. Uh, say, what are you doing, honey? You're going to bed. But I just told you I got to... You have to be in Denver for breakfast, I know. Well, I'll call the committee and tell them that they can have a luncheon instead. I'm sure they'd rather have you there alive instead of half dead. Well, I guess I am a little weary. Oh, you're such a fool, dear. Oh, maybe I'm the fool, worrying about you so much. You know what, honey? If it hadn't been for you, why, I'd be scattered all over the prairie someplace. Never amounted to a hill of beans. Somehow you always managed to piece me together again. Oh, don't be silly. I, I just want you to keep your health, that's all. You know, I don't think you realize all the wonderful things you're doing. It's not just the money you're raising. You're giving people back something they've lost. It's, it's kind of a courage and morale and hope all rolled into one. People are beginning to laugh at themselves again. Maybe that's it. But whatever it is, you're doing it. And if you're... Will? 
You sleep, darling? Huh? Huh? Oh, now, if that ain't just exactly like a woman. A minute ago, you bawled me out for not being asleep. Well, not in the chair, dear. Now, get undressed. Yes? Uh, sorry, Mr. Rogers. Uh, it's not permitted to have a lady in the room. Hotel rules, you know. But this ain't no lady. This is my wife. Huh? Oh, I'm terribly sorry. Uh, Mrs. Rogers, please, I hope you don't think Now, don't I... spoil it by apologizing. I've never been so flattered in my whole life. <laughs> Something else that some of you may remember. The Democratic National Convention in Chicago in 1932 and the nomination from the state of Oklahoma. Mr. Chairman, the state of Oklahoma would like to enter the name of its favorite son and favorite American for the presidency of the United States, Will Rogers. Once in my life, I'm kind of stuck for something to say. <laughs> of course, there's no honor in the world like being nominated for president of the United States, even if this is just a favorite son nomination, and even if my being up here is just sort of a joke, I couldn't be prouder. It's, it's been my life, lot in life to play the fool and to make people laugh. I've kidded an awful lot of big men, but I've had mighty few complaints. I guess that's the sign of a big man. I've, uh, I've tried living my life so that whenever I quit, I'm ahead. I've been an awful lucky fella. I've been all over the world. I've met kings and rickshaw boys, senators and farmers, more people than most people would meet in 10 lifetimes. And I never met a man I didn't like. I'd I'd like to thank the delegates from Oklahoma. The two finest things that can happen to a man is to have a good wife and to know he's been accepted by the people he comes from, and, and, and it looks like both of them have happened to me. Not long after that, Will was back home back to the ranch in California. You know, honey, I used to regret that we didn't live 30 or 40 years earlier in the old Indian territory where we met, but, but now I know it ain't true. I guess I wouldn't change anything, not since that first day, darling, when you broke my banjo with a bathtub. Oh. <laughs> Do you realize that after all these years, that's the first time you ever called me darling? I know, but I've been thinking it over. Oh, Will, what's that plane doing over there? That's old Wiley showing off his new ship. I forgot to tell you, honey, he's dropping in tonight for supper. Not just for supper. Wiley's like Pa. He doesn't drop in unless he has something on his mind. Well, maybe. We have been kind of figuring on a little trip up to Alaska. Well, why way up there? Uh, well, you see, honey, when I was a kid, I flunked a geography exam, and ever since then, I've had a hankering to go up there and find the right answers. Uh, look, if you don't want me to read the letters you get from Washington, then don't leave them open on the dining room table. What letters? Well, for instance, the one about the appropriation bill for Alaskan defense. Huh? Well, isn't that a pretty unpopular thing for you to be backing? Nowadays, everybody's talking about saving rather than spending. This is the best country in the world, honey, but you can't live in it for nothing. And so Will and Wiley Post went to Alaska. How many times had I said goodbye to him? And yet as we stood there at the airport, somehow never before did we seem so close. I had the feeling our whole life together was being summed up in this moment of parting. I think Will must have felt it, too, as though a premonition. Because after they took off, they came back over the field again to wave one more goodbye, as if reluctant to end something that I know now can never be ended.
Will Rogers never came back from that flight. And yet, in a sense, he never left us. There's a statue of Will Rogers at the Memorial Museum in Claremore, Oklahoma. It says, Will Rogers, 1879-1935. And the simple legend, I never met a man I didn't like. In a moment, our stars will return. Up in Newfoundland, there's an Air Force base called Fort McAndrew. Two tech sergeants were out on the field one day and noticed a nine-year-old girl hobbling around on a pair of crutches. She was a polio victim and a cripple. Her father, whom they finally located after much questioning of the girl, was a civilian employee on the field. He had eight children and simply couldn't afford the costly treatments that would be necessary to help his little girl. Well, that was enough for the two sergeants. They got up entertainments, collected donations, and, well, soon every enlisted man, officer, and civilian worker around the place was in on the project. They raised $4,300, enough to fly the little girl to the United States and provide treatments at Warm Springs, Georgia. Such acts by you and your friends today are shaping our world of tomorrow. Now, here's Mr. Cummings with our stars. Jane Wyman and Will Rogers, Jr., you were simply great. Please come forward for a bow. <laughs> well, I never dreamed when your father and I were at the Fox Studios years ago that you and I would appear together on a radio program. Did you direct some of Dad's pictures? No, he was king on the lot then, but I directed the little princess, Shirley Temple. Well, I should think you'd know all these things, Will. <laughs> All I know is what I read in the papers. <laughs> <laughs> no wonder you just read one paper, the Beverly Hills Citizen. <laughs> Largest weekly in the West, and the best paper in Beverly Hills. <laughs> <laughs> Stop, you're killing me. It's the only paper in Beverly Hills. And still the best. And if you'll read it... If you you'll read it, you'd know Stop, You're mm. Killing Me is Warner Brothers' latest picture starring Broderick Crawford and Claire <laughs> Trevor. <laughs> Plug. And if everybody read it, they'd know that Will is the publisher. And that he was only persuaded to act because he's so like his father. You know, Will, I once asked your father why he never kissed his leading la lady in pictures. And he said, because he saved his kisses for your mother. <laughs> That's right. But he'd had a hard time resisting Janie here. You kissed Janie in the picture. Uh, yes, but when I did that, I figured it was like I was kissing my mother. I mean, it was like my father kissing my mother. Oh, what's playing here next week? <laughs> a taut, suspenseful story that will keep you right on the edge of your seat. Because it's that exciting Paramount picture, Appointment with Danger, and as our stars, one of your outstanding favorites, William Holden, and one of our most charming young actresses, Colleen Gray. Now we'll be listening, Irving. Good night. Good, Good night. Good night, and all our stars. by Mr. Irving Cummings. Our orchestra is under the direction of Rudy Schrager. This is Ken Carpenter inviting you to join us next week at this same time for another presentation of the Hollywood Radio Theater.
Radio Theater is a presentation of the United States Armed Forces Radio Service.